The Northwest Seaport Alliance is a marine cargo partnership combining the Puget Sound ports of Seattle and Tacoma. Over 80% of the total amount of trade from Alaska to the contiguous United States comes through the Puget Sound. And in 2017, over $75 billion of trade was exported and imported internationally through the Puget Sound. The Alliance is an ex excellent case of an organization that has a focus on sustainability by reducing air emissions and restoring habitats for fish and wildlife. John has been involved in shipping for many years and has included positions as CEO and Terminal Operations Manager for the Port of Tacoma. He also is on the board for Governor Jay Inslee's Marine Innovation Advisory Council as well as on um, various committees for local business including the Executive Council for Greater Tacoma and Tacoma Pierce County Chamber of Commerce. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Mr. John Wolf. Uh, thanks. Okay, first, can you hear me okay? All right, good. Um, well, thank you all for uh, spending an hour with me. I know uh, probably most of you, as I look around the room, are students. Um, maybe not all of you, yet I'm sure you have extremely busy schedules. I many years ago uh, was here at PLU as well, and uh, so I understand um, that, that aspect of your lives and what an exciting time it is and also a time of transition and a very busy time. So um, thanks again for making time here. I'm going to try not to put you to sleep for an hour, so I'm going to cover um, some things that, um, and I'm going to try and move through fairly quickly. And if if I move too quickly, it's okay to stop me, maybe raise your hand, and I'll, I'll um, try to answer any questions you may have along the way. Certainly we have, uh, I'll try and time my uh, presentation to 45 minutes or less, and then allow you other opportunity to ask questions, whether it relates to what I shared or other things that are top of mind for you. Um, so I'm going to cover three areas. First, I'm going to just share briefly about myself. Um, because that will put you to sleep if I talk too much about that. Um, then I'm going to share with you about the Seaport Alliance. And that hopefully will be exciting or interesting anyway because I, I find it a pretty fascinating study. And then uh, the third thing, time permitting, I'll touch on a few of the things I've, lessons I've learned in leadership. And I'm still learning. It's a lifelong journey. Um, yet I'm pretty passionate about leadership and and really uh, study other great leaders and, and the uh, aspects of what they bring to leadership to improve myself and my leadership role. So um, those three areas. So first, to begin very briefly, I grew up in the area. I'm a local kid. Grew up in the uh, Tacoma, Puyallup area. Um, was uh, moved here at a young age. My, my dad was a pilot in the Air Force, so we moved around a little bit when I was young, but settled here at a young age. Grew up here. And I recall uh, thinking when I was in high school that um, I didn't know where I wanted to go to college, but I didn't want to stay local. Well, I ended up at PLU. Um, a big part of that is as a result of this person that you may have heard about. His name was Frosty Westring. Frosty was a legendary football coach here at PLU. And I was a pretty good football player in high school. Thought I was better than what I was, but uh, Frosty graciously gave me an opportunity to play football here. More importantly, he gave me an opportunity to learn from him. He was a great mentor for me and many, many others that uh, had the opportunity to hang out with him for four and a half years, which I did. Um, we won a national championship my senior year. Um, more importantly, I made tremendous friendships here um, that I still today have connections with from uh, fellows that I went out on the gridiron with and now we're lifelong friends. So um, it was a pretty exciting and unique time. We got a chance as a football team to travel to France my sophomore year. We got a chance to travel to Australia and New Zealand, ending up in Hawaii my senior year just after winning the national championship and graduating. That was probably the highlight of my time here. Um, and so some really neat experiences and lessons learned from a great coach and mentor, Frosty Westring. So that's what brought me here. When I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I studied business, had a business degree, 
and uh, like many people went to work for Boeing because Boeing's a huge employer still today in the state and um, I went into the computer science um, field uh, back then I'm not I'm gonna I'm gonna age myself here I recall the first person at PLU that had a laptop com or a, not even a laptop a computer uh, a desktop computer because back when I was in school it was mainframe mostly so um, um, there were no cell phones uh, so just to give you a sense about what's changed over the last number of years decades um, so it was a different time different place but uh, um, some things have changed dramatically others have and I went to work at Boeing w became disenchanted there worked there about two years um, heard about this opportunity with a company called Sealand. Sealand was a shipping line, uh, the largest shipping line in the world. I didn't know anything about it and got a, a job in their um, sales support, uh, computer support area. And that was a door to unlimited opportunity that I didn't have any idea about. Um, I moved through the organization in many different roles, ended up in operations, uh, got to oversee one of the largest terminals on the West Coast. Um, they asked me to enter into a management trainee program at that point and travel the world. I was married. We had two young kids. Uh, my wife is from here. We decided we're not going to walk through that door as exciting as it seemed to be. Um, and we decided to stay close to home. I thought I need to do something different then and went to work for a small port, Port of Olympia, um, just down in Olympia, Washington. Um, learned a heck of a lot there, ended up becoming the executive director, CEO of the Port of Olympia, and then Port of Tacoma called and said, hey, we'd like you to come back to Tacoma. So I've been at Tacoma now since 2005 as the um, executive director since 2010. Um, shortly thereafter, well, um, uh, four years later, I guess, five years later, uh, we, we competed uh, Tacoma with Seattle, and we competed with many other ports up and down the coast, uh, the Canadian ports to the north of us, and also uh, the California ports. And, um, and, and that competition in Puget Sound uh, went like this. Um, we had all of these international shipping lines calling either the Port of Seattle or Port of Tacoma and all the cargo that's moving through these two ports and the jobs um, and the job creation that comes with it. And ports are created essentially as public entities to create jobs and economic wealth for the community we serve through the business that we can attract to our port. So we were a competitive group at the Port of Tacoma and we were trying to take Seattle's business. And Seattle was trying to take our business. And it went back and forth like a tennis game. Sometimes we were winning, sometimes they were winning. Yet from a regional standpoint, we weren't winning. All we were doing was moving the desk chairs, uh, deck chairs around the, uh, the, the vessel, and, so to speak, and we weren't growing the gateway um, significantly. And so um, the two commissions, um, and, and I should explain uh, that I report now to 10 bosses before I reported to five. They're elected officials by the county they serve. So in Tacoma, there are five elected commissioners um, serving the Port of Tacoma, serving Pierce County residents, and your port in, in uh, Puget Sound, Tacoma. Seattle, the same. Seattle has five elected commissioners uh, serving the Port of Seattle. Um, they serve unlimited terms. They serve for four-year terms. They can serve unlimited terms. They just have to get reelected. Um, so, uh, we, the, the two commissions came together and said, there's got to be a better way to do this. And now I'm shifting into my presentation on, on the Northwest Seaport Alliance. So this picture uh, illustrates uh, what happened uh, four and a half years ago when the Port of Tacoma Commission, the Port of Seattle Commission came together and said, we're going to form a joint venture company we are going to form the Northwest Seaport Alliance and we are going to no longer compete with each other. We're going to approach this international business as a gateway rather than Port of Seattle and Port of Tacoma. And at that point in time, I was invited to be the CEO of the Northwest Seaport Alliance. And um, again, it's a 50-50 joint venture between the two ports. And essentially, I'll try and simplify it, essentially what it is is we took assets, terminal assets at the Port of Tacoma, 
and equal value terminal assets at the Port of Seattle, and we combine those. And we, when I say equal, what happens, if, for those of you that are finance majors or understand finance, we had to um, come up with a model whereby the contribution by the Port of Seattle and Port of Tacoma was equal financially. And we did that through our um, income streams associated with the properties that we were licensing to the Seaport Alliance to oversee. And we um, took a, a 10 year net present value on those um, income streams and um, then um, came up with equal value by contributing more to um, from Seattle or more from Tacoma to get to that equal value. So it truly is a 50-50 joint venture. And what that means is the Seaport Alliance team um, is charged with creating more business activity, more jobs, and also generating money like any business would. And then we distribute those funds back to the home ports on an equal basis so that the home ports can pay their debt that they're investing in the Seaport Alliance and then um, reinvest back into the Seaport Alliance. So the home ports are our bank, so to speak, and we're the operating uh, commercial arm of these two ports for all cargo. Um, there are some things, some activities that remain at the home port of Seattle and Tacoma. Port of Seattle, as an example, you may know that Port of Seattle is the owner and operator of SeaTac Airport, uh, one of the larger airports in the nation. And, and the fastest growing airport in the nation. So I don't, I don't have any responsibility for SeaTac Airport. That's under the um, control of the executive director of the Port of Seattle. And in Port of Tacoma, it's a smaller piece of business, but uh, there's some real estate activities at the Port of Tacoma that are outside the Seaport Alliance that the executive director of Port of Tacoma oversees. So think of big ships, containers, uh, rolling stock cargo, auto imports, all of that activity is what the Seaport Alliance oversees. So these are uh, illustrations of uh, our two harbors. Uh, the Seattle Harbor is uh, shown here. This may not mean a whole lot to you, but uh, if you look at, I think this uh, button here, yeah. The, um, downtown core is over here. If you're familiar with uh, the baseball stadium and the Seahawk football stadium, right here. Um, these are the terminals uh, that we oversee for the Seaport Alliance, okay, in the Seattle Harbor. And then in the Tacoma Harbor, um, if you're familiar, I-5 going through Tacoma, um, off to the north, you can see all the terminal activity and, and we essentially oversee all of this Tide Flats area, all the business activity in here. So one may ask, well, why are ports important? Why are the Port of Tacoma and Seattle important? We recently did an economic impact study of the Port of Seattle and Tacoma to see what true value are we creating for the public? Because again, we're public business. We're owned by the taxpayers of Pierce and King County. Um, and so uh, we did an economic impact study. And what we found was that some 58,000 jobs are supported by the Northwest Seaport Alliance across Washington State. 58,000 jobs. And these are high paying jobs. These are jobs that are fully benefited uh, jobs. They're jobs that are family wage jobs, meaning that uh, a person working for the Seaport Alliance or involved in this business uh, can support on average a family of four um, comfortably. So these are, these are not low paying uh, jobs. And you may hear, you know, whether it's a, a longshore job on the dock, whether it's a truck trucking company that's uh, transporting freight, the railroads, the warehouse distribution companies, all of those are examples of jobs created by the Northwest Seaport Alliance throughout the state of Washington. Um, you can see that uh, we, through our business activities, we create over $12 billion in economic impact to the state of Washington. So. A significant impact to the state. In fact, an interesting factoid, um, one or 40 percent of the jobs in the state of Washington are directly or indirectly tied to trade. And therefore, uh, the state of Washington is one of the top, if not the top, 
uh, states for um, uh, jobs related to uh, its ports and trade. So trade is very important to the state of Washington. And not just right down in the tide flats. When you think about looking at eastern Washington, and you're, if you've been over there and you see the farming community, well, those farmers are growing crops that feed the world. They're shipping potatoes, cherries, onions, um, hay, other agricultural products through our ports to countries abroad. And that, so that's part of the economic impact of the state with these deep water ports. In fact, we are um, the fourth largest container gateway in North America. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it because of our population center relative to the other population centers that are ahead of us. As an example, LA Long Beach is number one. Well, look at the population center around um, Southern California. Huge, right? Um, guess what the second uh, gateway is in North America? New York, New Jersey. Uh, another huge population center. Uh, the third one may be more difficult for you to guess. It's on the East Coast. Anyone want to try? Did someone say Florida? Okay, close. A little, little north of Florida. Georgia. Georgia Port Authority. Uh, they, uh, they have surpassed the Northwest Seaport Alliance. We're sort of neck and neck. We're in fourth position. Hopefully we can catch them. But the, they, they, uh, they have really grown their business and their, and their uh, port in the last 10 years. And then we are number four. So when you think about it in North America, to be number four, and you look at our population center, which isn't anything to sneeze about, but it's not, certainly not nearly as large as those other areas of the United States, um, that's pretty significant. This is a busy slide. Um, basically, it, it highlights some of the uh, commodities that we're importing through our uh, ports and exporting through our ports. And so imports, of course, are coming in from other countries. And, um, and you can see industrial machinery is number one, electrical machinery, vehicles, uh, toys, games, sporting equipment, the clothes you wear. I suspect if you were to look into your closet and look at the tags on your clothing, um, much of that clothing was not made here in the United States. Um, and therefore, guess where it came to? It didn't just show up at whatever s your favorite store is. It moved on a vessel from that manufacturing center through the Port of Seattle or Tacoma into a container, onto a truck, driven to a warehouse, distributed out, and ultimately ended up in that retail store. Or, more recently, Amazon, where you just order online. I'm still getting used to that, by the way. Uh, exports. Uh, you can see our exports, uh, the grains, the seeds, the fruits, um, industrial machinery as well. Uh, fruits and vegetables, seafood is a big export commodity, uh, and so forth. So it just gives you a, a flavor of what kinds of cargoes are moving in and out of our port. This slide um, helps you to better understand geographically the trade that we have with other parts of the world. Um, Something I like to share, I, I have the privilege of traveling to Asia and Europe quite often to visit our customers. And what's neat about having these ports of Seattle and Tacoma here in the state of Washington is folks in these other countries in Asia and Europe, they know about Seattle and Tacoma. Now, they may know about it for other reasons as well. Um, maybe it's because of Microsoft being here or Amazon headquartered here or Boeing or that. They also know it because of our ports, because they depend on trade for their economic wealth as well. And so um, we have great partnership relationships with many of these countries in Asia and Europe due to trade and the relationship that we have between our ports. It's important to note, and this slide um, shares a little bit more about why we're the fourth largest gateway for trade. More than 50% of the cargo moving through our gateway, Seattle-Tacoma ports, doesn't stay here. It moves by truck or rail to inland markets. And our sweet spot there is uh, in the upper Midwest, the greater um, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois area, into Ohio Valley, into Kansas, Minnesota, that upper Midwest area. So 
Um, rail service is really important to us, effective, efficient rail service, and we depend upon the strong partnerships with the BNSF Railroad and the UP Railroad to move those cargoes from the ports to those inland markets in an efficient way. So there's been a tremendous amount of change going on in the industry, and um, it's hard for me to fully explain this without you living the industry, but let me, let me try. Um, on the, on the, your left um, is a slide, that, a wheel that shows all of the different major shipping lines throughout the world, and these are international carriers of significance. What's happened over the last number of years is there's been huge mergers of these shipping lines and acquisitions and even a bankruptcy of one of the shipping lines. And the reason for that is, is that it's simple economics. Uh, the shipping lines have struggled to create a balance of their vessel capacity in the marketplace with the demand for goods moving uh, uh, across the ocean um, in the trade corridors. And so what happens is if you have too much supply and not enough demand for your service, your price drops, right? And then you start chasing cargo because you want to fill those ships up. And um, so it's a perpetual problem because now you're chasing freight at lower rates, losing money, and pretty soon you have companies going out of business. And we've experienced this coming out of the recession uh, back in the uh, late 2000s and even today where the shipping lines are really struggling to show a profit. And their um, investments in their assets is huge. I mean, think about a, a, a one container vessel. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. And so these are um, heavily asset-based companies and they are struggling to make money. And so what they're doing is they're merging. And that what they're trying to do is um, take capacity out of trade to balance the supply demand so they can get their pricing power up. In addition to that, what they've done is they've formed their own alliances. Just like we formed our port alliance, the Northwest Seaport Alliance between Seattle and Tacoma so we wouldn't compete with each other, the shipping lines have formed their own alliances. And they've taken what were 20 carriers and formed essentially three major alliances. Now, they still compete within those alliances, but what they do is they share assets. So as an example, um, your XYZ shipping line and your partner with three other sh uh, shipping lines that are, have different trade lanes and different vessels and different trade lanes, you form a pack, and, and in that pack, you get a share, you get a buy space, essentially, on these other shipping lines, vessels, and they get a buy on yours. So you spread that risk and that cost out um, over... Um, the, the other alliance partners, and you find efficiencies in doing that. So we've, we've seen uh, tremendous change both in mergers and acquisitions, yet also in the formation of these shipping uh, alliances. The other huge phenomenon and change in our industry is upsizing of vessels. And so um, back uh, a number of years ago, maybe 10 years ago, a 5,000 TU vessel, the, the vessel shown in orange there, was a large vessel. That was a large vessel in trade. Today, um, this, this slide is actually outdated. Now, um, they're making, uh, they're building vessels that are 23,000 TU. So, it would be larger than that dark blue vessel. Um, these vessels are humongous. Yes. I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. I'm talking uh, industry jargon. Uh, so container, essentially. A TU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. So if you see driving down the road a, um, a large container on a, on a, a chassis and um, it looks like it's about 40 feet long, it is 40 feet long, that would be two TUs. <laughs> um, so um, the industry measures vessel capacity in TU or 20-foot equivalent unit. Great question, thank you. Uh, so, boxes, essentially. Uh, it, this this uh, chart, again, just um, wa I wanted to illustrate the significant change in what's happening in our industry where they're upsizing. Now, you may ask, well, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Well, it's simple economics again. The theory being that um, if I have an 18,000 uh, container vessel and um, 
and my fixed costs are the same, my fuel costs, my labor costs, all that, my slot costs become less because I can spread those fixed costs over a larger volume, right? So um, by loading up an 18,000 TU vessel and bringing it to Seattle, Tacoma, my per uh, slot cost or container cost is far less. Therefore, I'm more competitive. In theory, that makes sense. The challenge is, is that when you have all of the shipping lines taking their 5,000 TU vessels and scrapping them and building new 10 to 18,000 TU vessels, you perpetuate that problem I talked about before where you have too much capacity because everyone is adding capacity and then you're um, not filling up your vessel and you're chasing uh, cargo because you're trying to fill up the vessel at rates that aren't compensatory and you're losing money. So the industry is a little bit dysfunctional um, and um, they're still struggling to find a way to balance the supply demand. And in the middle of all that, you have things like trade wars that you, I'm sure you've all heard about between U.S. and China that throw wrinkles into um, trade forecasts or, um, you know, whether it's a drought somewhere or fuel prices change. There are so many inputs into this global marketplace. Um, it, it, it takes, I spend and our team spends so much time just trying to stay on top of day-to-day -day changes and how they're going to affect our industry and how we need to respond to them. It's a pretty dynamic industry. So pressures on our success. I've touched on some of these. Increasing costs. Um, we, we have significant, significantly higher costs in making sure that our infrastructure is ready for these larger vessels. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we have uh, regulatory requirements that we have to adhere to. As an example, we are uh, very much focused on uh, growing our business in an environmentally friendly way. So we need to be sensitive to water quality issues, stormwater issues, um, what's happening to that rainwater when it hits the terminal and then goes into Commencement Bay, um, air quality issues, um, the trucks, the vessels, the yard equipment that are operating at the terminal all typically run on heavy diesel fuel, which emits um, bad things into the air. <laughs> so we are, um, the industry is really working hard to look at alternative fuels, cleaning up um, the industry as we grow the industry. So uh, the regulatory requirements are much more stringent, therefore higher costs. Uh, land use pressures are um, always there. A good example of that, I showed the graph of Port of Seattle and right on the other side of that one terminal, Terminal 46, were two stadiums, right? And a downtown. Well, that community starts to scratch their head and say, wait a minute, I don't know that I want this big industrial terminal with all these trucks and vessels and that. I'd rather have a basketball stadium and um, restaurants and hotels. So we feel this constant pressure of um, uh, compatible land use with the commercial uh, waterfront and, and downtown core, and even to some degree residential. Um, and so those are pressures that we're constantly dealing with. Um, there are always political pressures, whether they're at a local level with um, a city, county government, and aligning our interests and making sure that we're working together with shared uh, vision of growth. Uh, at the state level, um, you know, I, I touched on some of those things where we feel this constant pressure to compete and have a low-cost solution for our customers so we can attract more cargo and more jobs to the state offset by some of the regulatory requirements that the state is placing on our industry. Um, we feel uh, pressures at the federal level. Um, certainly, the, the one that's front and center is the, uh, the trade dispute between the U.S. and China, which is very complex so, and, and affects our business. Uh, we feel competition from uh, other areas for that, what we call discretionary cargo. That's the cargo that's not staying local, that's going inland. Um, and so we're competing with the Canadian ports and the California ports. Uh, the Panama Canal has been widened, so the all-water route to the East Coast. We're competing all the time. Our scorecard 
um, at the end of the day is one of cargo equals job creation for all of us and good paying jobs. That's why we care about it, but we, we, we feel these competitive pressures all the time. And then, of course, um, we're all experiencing more traffic congestion. Um, and um, gosh, um, I don't need to say a whole lot about that. We all um, live that. And our trucks are on the roads with all of the personal owned vehicles. So um, we have this, this chart just shows all of the different players that we work with. And I won't walk through all these, but there are many. Um, and so I mentioned this is a dynamic industry. I was talking to my sister. My sister is highly educated, has a master's degree, and, and is a teacher. And, um, and she said, you know, John, I never really understood the port business until I spent some time talking with you. And I can't believe how complex it is because I used to drive by all the time and see the port of Tacoma and I'd see the vessels come in and cargo get off and, ves and cargo go back on and the vessel leaves. It seems pretty simple. Yet all of these other inputs into the system that I'm sharing with you and more right here make this a very complex business, dynamic business. It's actually extremely interesting and at times a little bit stressful. So these larger vessels are taxing our system. It's like any system. Think of any system that is created. When one tries to push more stuff through a system um, than what it can handle, it chokes, right? And it might choke at one point or another point, but it doesn't really matter. If it chokes, if it, if it gets clogged, it backs up the whole system. That Think of our port as a system. It starts with the, the, the wharf there where the vessel is tied up. And you can see these cranes up here. This is um, a Husky terminal in Tacoma. Those are the lo largest cranes in uh, Seattle, Tacoma today. There were eight of them. They came in about a year ago. Um, they're larger because our vessels are larger, so it makes sense that you have to have larger vessel, or cranes, higher, longer booms to reach out over these um, larger vessels. Not only that, but you have to rebuild the whole wharf because those cranes weigh a lot more than the older cranes you can see at the north end up there. Um, so we had to tear out this whole wharf and rebuild it. And then we had to improve the yard um, associated with it and improve our gate access for the trucks, and the rail, all of that, $300 million rough, rough uh, uh, dollar amount. $300 million we invested just because the shipping lines decided they wanted to bring larger vessels to our port. But if we didn't, then they wouldn't be calling here. They would go to another port and those jobs would leave our state. Those 58,000 jobs that I highlighted would leave our state. So we're compelled to respond and it's expensive. There's a picture of the cranes coming in on the vessel. Those, that vessel transited the Pacific Ocean uh, with those cranes on it. Pretty amazing. <laughs> um, and then in, in Seattle, uh, Terminal 5 today looks similar to this. Um, and in about a year and a half, we're going to do a similar kind of uh, construction project that we did in Tacoma with Husky Terminal. We're going to tear out this wharf. These are older cranes. We're going to rebuild the wharf, strengthen it, put those new superposed Panamax large cranes on there so that we can handle large vessels here. And we're going to make a bunch of improvements to this yard, $350 million of our money. And then combined with a private sector company that we partnered with that is leasing this terminal, they're going to put about $250 million in. So north of half a billion dollars into this terminal. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, great point. Um, the the vessels, and as they get larger, they get longer too. So that becomes a problem. Uh, this terminal, when it's finished, will be able to handle two of the largest vessels. Um, now, um, if you have a third one calling here, then you got that problem. And vessel operators do not like to wait out at anchor. At the cost per day to operate a vessel is about $70,000. So that adds up pretty quick. Uh, this other terminal uh, right next door, Terminal 18, 
is a three birth terminal. So, and it will all be controlled by the same operator, these two terminals. So they'll essentially five terminals. So it should be adequate for our needs, but uh, it's, a, it's a really good uh, point you make. And it's important that a, a one birth terminal is not effective in this industry. Um, you at least have to have two, I'll call it births is, is another term, but parking spots for vessels. They do, yet um, schedule integrity is a huge problem uh, because they get caught up in other ports and, and then um, there's, especially in the wintertime, they hit storms um, and typhoons in, in Far East. And so uh, it's something we measure and we, tr we actually incentivize, we put incentives, uh, financial incentives to try and get the vessels um, to call on time. They do bunch and it becomes a, I talked about the system that's a good way to choke the system because then you get all this cargo coming in two days and um, the gate clogs up, the yard clogs up. Um, it, it's a mess and it takes a while to dig out. Yeah. Yes. So I want to give you a scenario here. Say ship hits the fan and um, one of your carriers carrying the main fan to your bigger ship that you know, goes into your fleet and um, essentially your fin bosses are looking at you. So what do you do? Okay, so the question was, um, what happens if a vessel explodes at sea or a container does? Like a disaster. Yeah, a disaster. So, so as a port authority, uh, we're not um, owners or operators of the vessel, so we don't have responsibility for the vessels at sea. Um, we do have some responsibility for the operation here at the terminal. So if something bad were to happen at the terminal, we might get pulled into it. Oftentimes, think of us as a landlord. We own all this property. We typically lease the property to private sector companies, and then they operate. So for the most part, they're responsible for their operations. And there are regulatory agencies, that, like the Coast Guard, that would be all over something like that, what you're describing. But it wouldn't fall on us to be responsible for that. Let me grab this question and then over here. Yeah, and they do. Um, yeah, um, the great point. Um, there are noise restrictions um, working with the city, and that's all spelled out in permits. Um, yet these vessels operate around the clock. It's too expensive for them. Often, t so there's three shifts um, defined in a 24-hour time frame. There's a eight to five, six to three in the morning, and a three to eight. Um, oftentimes they don't op. They they um, cease operation during the three to eight because it's an expensive shift. It's overtime and it's only five hours. But if they have to, they can work around the clock. Yeah. Question here. Um, so it kind of has to do with maybe my time frame. So because, yeah. uh, say it's at night, for example, and you need to go to more people after work, that doesn't uh, rule that if you're a shift operator or a shift company that you have to have still shift to just keep going somewhere and since yeah, it, it doesn't really affect us in the short run because the financial uh, returns to us are by the lease payments. So those are fixed, okay. regardless of whether the cargo comes or not. Okay. Yeah, it'd be more about jobs. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is just another part of our system. Uh, we are, for those of you that are uh, more familiar with the Tacoma area, and SR-167, we're going to uh, work, we're working with the state of Washington to expand 167 um, out to Puyallup where it dead ends, um, and also some improvements to 509 up north um, for our freight um, movement, and that is really important for us because, again, it's a system, and the trucks need to be able to get to and from the huge warehouse distribution centers that are in the Kent, Auburn, Sumner, Puyallup Valley. Um, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly because I know we're short on time. Um, the, um, we, we spent a lot of time with our, with our port team working on port operations and operational excellence, and it's about that system I talked about. So we, we come around the system. We have a huge operations center with cameras that show day-to-day, real-time operations, and we're working with our customers, our tenants, labor force, 
to constantly improve the performance of our gateway. Um, this goes into more detail on that, and I'm not going to um, get into all of the detail. But um, the, the point here is that uh, in a digital world that we're living in today, in our industry, there is so much data. The challenge is it's in silos. And the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand. And data is only valuable if it's shared and can be used to make more informed decisions. So the industry is really wrestling with this whole issue around how do we capture this data and organize it in a way where we can make better decisions. Um, and it is, uh, you've got antitrust immunity issues, you've got um, cybersecurity issues associated with sharing data and many other reasons why it's difficult, but we're working on this and it's a really important initiative for us. And then of course I mentioned the environment and I don't uh, mean to touch on this lightly, uh, more and more we as ports and our industry are challenged to um, do things in a more environmentally friendly way. And so we are spending, I'll give you a sense of that, we have spent about $200 million over the last 10 years on environmental cleanup projects um, just in our um, gateway. $200 million. So it's real money. And we're continuing to look for ways to uh, clean up the industry so that we all have a healthy place to live as we have good paying jobs. So that's the, my, uh, the conclusion of my presentation. I know um, we've got about 15 minutes. I was asked to touch on, um, on leadership. Uh, and I, I've got, I, I could go on about leadership. I, I, I'm really passionate about it and ever learning more about leadership and studying leadership, effective leadership. Um, I mentioned at the outset um, Frosty Westring. And um, for those of you that um, don't know him or haven't heard about him, he was a passionate leader, a powerful leader, someone that I consider as a mentor um, in my younger years and um, still today use many of the tools that he taught me. Um, one of uh, humility, of um, not taking yourself too seriously, yet to really... Um, um, work in teams, and I think there is power in, in working in, in a team atmosphere. So we put a lot of emphasis on that in our organization about no one individual is more important than any other, yet together we can do pretty powerful things. And, and Frosty used a, an example, and it may be um, um, a, a simple example, but he, he would take a toothpick, he'd take a box of toothpicks and he'd pull one out and he said, break one, it's pretty easy, right? take three or four, a little bit tougher, grab the whole box, try and break it. Pretty tough. Um, lesson learned there. Um, so um, humility is a big thing. Um, I'd say find your passion. Um, I have two young adults. Um, they're in their early 20s, and they often say to me, Dad, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. And I'm like, yeah, I'm still trying to figure it out too. So um, don't... don't um, just uh, my, my advice is um, spend some time thinking about what you're passionate about because you will be good at that and it will be enjoyable um, and uh, you can be great at it. So um, follow your passions. Um, don't, don't get hung up on having to figure out what you want to do next 10 years because some of you might have that figured out but many of us didn't. Don't. I didn't. Um, As leaders, um, I've learned to um, do things that I would expect others to do. I call it uh, sweeping the shed. So um, I'm not, as a CEO, too big to uh, not sweep the shed, grab the broom and sweep the shed. So um, I think that is a lesson learned um, by example of leadership of um, lifting your organization, not top down. And so think of it as a reverse pyramid and the leader is on the bottom lifting the organization. That's the, that's the job of leadership is to lift and empower your team members, equip them with, uh, with the tools they need to be successful, empower them to do great things. And I will tell you on our team, we have people on our team that amaze me each and every day. They're far smarter than I am and they um, have a passion for what they do and 
um, we collectively set the vision and they go off and do great things and come back and say, John, look at this. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, how did you do that? <laughs> um, so it's pretty cool and fun. Um, another uh, aspect of leadership that I've learned and still learning is um, to listen more. And um, so I catch myself when I, I spend a lot of time in meetings. And when I'm on my game, I listen. I don't talk, I listen, and I might ask a few questions, yet my job is to listen, and, um, and, and I think it starts there. God gave us two ears, one mouth, so we should spend more time listening than talking. Um, I, for me, spending some time each and every day um, before, you know, the whistle blows and we get into the throes of the day to spend some quiet time and just reflection and get centered, as Frosty would say it, on, uh, on what is important. And, uh, and so I encourage you to think about that. Maybe many of you do that, but um, find that quiet space. And even throughout the day, when you feel stressed about something, to just find a quiet moment, even for a couple minutes, to take a deep breath and get yourself back in a, uh, centered and however you choose to do that. Um, so those are just a few of the lessons. Let me see if I, I have any others that I wanted to touch on here. But um, Frosty shared um, many things with us during my time here, and I've got my playbook still today in my office, and I reflect on it. One of the things that he shared, and um, and it was actually uh, created by Theodore Roosevelt, uh, our 26th president. I want to read this to you because I think it's meaningful, and then I'll open it up for questions. Um, and it's meaningful because, for me, because there are always critics. Um, there are always people that are shooting at us, right? Um, and and, um, and uh, oftentimes they're not maybe fully understanding what's going on in the arena, so to speak, whatever your arena is. And um, it, so it's easy to be a critic. It's easy for me to look at what's going on somewhere, not fully understanding it and saying, why are they doing that? That's stupid. That's silly. Um, and so I, I reflect on this quite a bit, and, um, and especially in times where we're getting beat down as a port authority um, by those that are criticizing our, our, our port. Um, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man, and, and in this case man, woman, who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. Who knows the great devotion, who spends himself or herself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the high achievement of triumph, and who at worst, if he or she fails, while daring greatly, knows his or her place shall never be with those timid and cold souls who know neither victory nor defeat. So I share that with you because that is really meaningful to me, and, um, and I, I think that's uh, something that each of us have experienced and will continue to experience in, in our lives. Is, so get engaged, get in the arena, give it your best shot, um, and, um, and you'll be successful. So with that, happy to answer uh, other questions you may have in the 10 minutes that we have here. The mic is with me. Oh, okay. The seat is too strong. Hello. Hello? Can you hear me now? I don't really think I need a mic. Uh, so, with uh, regards to my question, is, uh, it's a leadership question, head question. So, with the trade war, is it kind of leaning, uh, given that China is your number one international trade partner, and you guys are in uh, Canada is not there, uh, technically international trade, uh, and the loom of economic recession being on the, on the brink here, what is your company doing from a leadership perspective to prepare for kind of the bottom line not being in the hands uh, instead of cutting? Do you have any 
Yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, so um, it's a multitude of things. Um, internally in our house, um, what we um, do is we tend to, to run pretty lean even in good times. And there's intent with that. And it's because of this. Because um, it's easy in good times to get out over our skis. And I've lived through that with organizations. And it's no fun because then when you hit the tough times, then you have to make those hard decisions and people get hurt. Um, so we run pretty lean. We ask a lot of our team. Um, and we give them a lot of um, flexibility and decision-making authority to do great things. Um, and so that we protect ourselves in our house if things turn. And, and it's all cyclical, so it will happen. It's just a matter of when and how deep and how long. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and, and we have to make some tough decisions just like anyone else or any other company. Um, you know, we prioritize our budget and there, there's a wish list that we start with and then we say, okay, let's get real with ourselves. What can we really do? And making sure that we've got uh, um, those priorities in the right order. So that's number one. Uh, number two is um, trying to affect change in a broader sense. And so I spend a lot of time, and others do on our team, um, trying to influence positive change um, where we don't have control, but we do have influence. So um, I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. I've testified in front of Congress around trade and how important trade is. And, and, and certainly I have my own opinions about trade with China, and I think there is some accountability, mutual accountability that we have with each other, yet we also are very dependent on each other. And this is a global economy. It's not any longer where, in my opinion, humble opinion, that we can just close our borders and say we can be self-sustaining on our own. That day has come and gone. We are a global economy. And that's a good thing because um, the other thing, and I'm getting a little off topic of your, your, your uh, question, but uh, my experience is through trade, you can develop powerful relationships that can overcome um, tensions, um, unhealthy tensions. So um, try to influence that at a local, state, federal level so that we can try and steer ourselves away from um, some of these unintentional uh, outcomes like a recession. Um, it's tough, though, because these are tough issues, and they're complex issues. It's not as though it's a simple answer. But I'd say where we have the greatest control, we watch it very closely, and we um, run a pretty tight ship. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, another really great question. Um, our, our strength of partnership right now is in um, North Asia, so uh, countries like Korea. Uh, Japan has uh, historically been a strong trading partner. Their economy has struggled a bit. So, uh, And then uh, Taiwan and China. We struggle uh, more so as the... Uh, we move further into Southeast Asia. And the reason for that is if you look on a, a map, um, when you start to move into Southeast Asia, like Singapore, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam even, um, it becomes more clear that the vessels can move through the um, Middle East, Suez Canal, up through the Atlantic to the East Coast. So we struggle there. But I would say that as an example, we're headed off next March to Vietnam with um, the West Coast ports and our rail partners. And we're going to um, be trying to strengthen that relationship because much of the manufacturing is moving into Vietnam um, and out of China. That won't happen in a year or two, but it will happen over time. Um, we're also watching what's happening in Central South America. That, that can be an opportunity for us with the North-South trade. And, um, and the other thing I should highlight, and I didn't touch on it too much, but we do have strong trading partnerships with Alaska, and that's domestic trade. Um, yet Alaska is a great trading partner for us, so it's, um, it's helpful to have um, those domestic trading partners. So I would say Vietnam... Um, and some of the Southeast Asian countries as best we can. Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're um, investing heavily in this area and we're looking for partners. In fact, we've tapped some of the universities already to talk to some of the um, students there to see if they can help us. That part of it is, is I won't say it's easy, but it's, it's um, available to us um, because people are eager to help and want a, that opportunity. The challenge for us in our industry, and, and the question is how to break through this, is that our industry is what I would call old school. Um, we're behind the times. Um, as an example, a, a terminal operator doesn't know that a truck driver is coming in to pick up a box until they show up at the gate and say, ring the doorbell, so to speak. That's crazy. That, that, that cargo was on the ocean for two weeks. Why can't we have data um, and information flowing that would communicate to people, hey, I'm, I'm, I know that box is going to be available on this date, and I will be making a reservation to pick it up on this time, and that will work in uniform. The reason is is that um, we have a hard time getting people to share their data because they are worried that other people are going to use it for their benefit. Um, so there's that competitive aspect. We have a difficult time because of cybersecurity issues, so people are worried that I'm, my system's going to get infected by sharing data, so we have that issue to overcome. Um, we have uh, issues where um, who, who gets to control the data? So our pitch is the Port Authority is the right convener of this. So as an example, and I had this on the, on the slide, if, if we as an independent uh, public entity are the convener and we create a master system and all the other systems can exist but they flow into this one system that is the umbrella system so to speak and then that system um, uses the data manipulates it and then pushes it out to the right folks to share um, and help people make real-time decisions that's the model we're exploring um, we're planning on spending a few million dollars over the next few years and that probably won't be enough to try and stand this up. We're not the only port that's doing this either. All the ports are looking at it. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Uh, <laughs> um, not very good. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, I think our vessel integrity meaning the window that they are scheduled to call versus when they actually get there is um, around 50% of the time. Uh, so it's not, it's not very, uh, and, and storms are one reason for that. Um, these vessels are calling multiple ports, and, and so all it takes is one port to have a choke in the system, and then it affects the downstream, right? And they're trying, they try and make up time, but it's hard. It's difficult. Yes, next Yeah, yeah, um, that's a really great question. Um, so we, we take all of our projects. Um, so some of them are revenue generating projects. Some of them are environmental projects that have, a, I would say, a different kind of return, not a financial return, but a different type of return. Um, we have um, projects that are um, like, um, system projects that don't have, like IT systems and those things that don't have a direct ROI. We weigh all of them and, and what's neat about our, our industry is one has to look through all those lenses to make the best decisions. You can't, and I had to learn this because I came from the private sector where everything was driven by bottom line net income. And in the port, it's not that way. It's much more dynamic. We have to think of the community concerns, the environmental concerns, the social issues, the business issues, um, labor issues, um, community issues. So it's very dynamic, and we put it all together, and, and we, we spent a lot of time wrestling with these things. And it's a balancing act, really, because at the end of the day, we only have so much in terms of resources. And, um, and so we pick and choose. And it's, it's, it's never all of this and none of this. It's a blend of all of it. Yeah. 
Uh, I know there are many other questions, but it's 7 p.m. Uh, so I think after the presentation, we can meet individually with John and ask a few questions. Sure. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for your attention. Hi. Is this on? Sorry. <laughs> All right, real quick, everyone, real quick. Uh, on behalf of the PLU School of Business, we'd like to thank everyone coming out um, and supporting this. Uh, once, we'd like to thank the Port of Tacoma for sponsoring the Executive Leadership Series. We'd like to thank John Wolf for taking time. And um, on behalf of the School of Business, here is a gift for you. Thank you.